Hi there, Psych Class. Welcome to your first psychology video. Uh, in Chapter 2, we're talking about the brain. Uh, this is Part 1 of the brain, but this is not Part 1 of Chapter 2. Remember, in class, we did some work on the neuron or the nerve cell and the nervous system as a whole. But let's talk about the control center or the brain in this presentation. Um, actually, we're going to, before we even get into the brain, talk very briefly about the endocrine system and so more detail would be covered in health class or anatomy class but here's what you need to know for psych the endocrine system is your body's slow chemical communication system and so all of the glands that you have throughout your body that secrete hormones into your bloodstream are your endocrine system uh, hormones are chemical messengers that are manufactured by these glands and know that actually some of these hormones are chemically identical to those neurotransmitters that we talked about when we were learning about the neuron or the nerve cell. And so the only thing besides that it's the slow chemical communication system that you need to know is the pituitary gland, which is actually in your brain. And it's the control center of the entire endocrine system. And so it's important because it influences your growth. Um, it's what sends messages to other glands to say, hey, release some hormones into the bloodstream. And it is in turn controlled by a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And so when we talk about the hypothalamus, just know that that's the boss of the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland what needs done. And then the pituitary gland sends out hormones to alert the other glands to release their hormones. So the pituitary gland, it's the middle management of the endocrine system. And that is the extent of the endocrine system for us. Uh, we talk more in psych about the nervous system. Uh, it's the faster means of communication in the body. But obviously, uh, all of us are human. And we certainly know that our hormones do indeed affect behavior and thoughts. So it's worth a brief mention. Okay, let's get into the brain here. We're going to start with the basics and the brain stem. That's the oldest region of the brain, the innermost region of our brain, um, and it's protected for good reason. Um, it's pretty important for basic functioning. Um, it's actually at the top of the spinal cord, so where the spinal cord enters the skull, we officially label it the brain stem, and there's two things you should know about the brain stem. The medulla is the base of the brain stem. It's what controls heart rate and breathing. Uh, any Adam Sandler fans probably will always remember Medulla because of the movie The Water Boy. But um, important, obviously, just for the basic survival. The pons located above the medulla uh, help coordinate movements. And so we'll work in class on, on labeling these things so that you can see exactly where they are in the brain. But that's, you know, basic survival. Um, additionally, uh, you'll be able to label where the cerebellum is. Uh, cerebellum is actually Latin, it means little brain. Uh, the cerebellum is important because it kind of integrates uh, input that's coming in from our senses and it coordinates voluntary but unconscious movement. So thanks cerebellum. Uh, that's the reason you can walk down the hall and talk to your friend and still make it to psych class on time. Uh, the cerebellum also helps judge time, uh, discriminate sounds and textures, control emotions. Again, I don't want you to think that it the emotions only happen here, but it's in a part of that. And um, it also is important in helping us process and store certain kinds of memories. And so when we get to the section on memory, we'll talk about the importance of the cerebellum to uh, learning and remembering information. Uh, but a good example of the cerebellum's role in memory would be uh, if it's storming out and you see a bolt of lightning, uh, you may kind of like flinch or cringe um, before you've even realized you've done it. And it's because the, of the memory of seeing lightning and it expecting thunder, uh, your cerebellum might have reacted before you were even consciously aware of what was going on. All right, so the next section of our, of our brain to learn is the limbic system. And so the limbic system uh, means border. And so it's kind of the connection between those basic brain functions we just talked about and the parts of the brain that we would call the newest. Um, 
And when we say oldest and newest, we're just talking on an, on an evolutionary scale. And so, like, primitive animals have the same functions in, as we have in our brainstem and in their cerebellum, um, but don't have the advanced thinking that we do in the cerebral hemispheres, which we won't even talk about in this video. We'll get there. But um, the limbic system is going to have um, some basic primitive emotion um, and drives and be helpful in memory formation. And so uh, don't worry, we'll talk about these. I don't want you to feel rushed um, as we go. All right, so the amygdala. That is uh, these tiny little lima bean sized clusters and there's one in, e in each hemisphere of the brain, the left and the right. And they, the amygdala, what you need to know that's important is that it's linked to aggression and fear. And so please keep in mind that aggression and fear involve activity in all levels of the brain, not just here, but this is, again, the, the primitive connection. And so fun with the amygdala. Sorry, cat fans, but electrical stimulation of a cat's amygdala can make a cat do this. And at the same time, you move that electrode very slightly to another section of their amygdala, uh, cage that same cat with a mouse, and it will cower in terror. And so dependent upon which part of the amygdala is stimulated, we can either give uh, uh, aggressive behavior or fear, uh, fear behavior. Uh, the hypothalamus. Hey, we talked about that already, right? Hypo, it's, so it's, it's located below the thalamus. And um, it's going to direct um, body maintenance. And so eating, drinking, stable body temperature, your hypothalamus is kind of controlling all of that. We know a part of that is the fact that it's the one dictating what happens in your endocrine system. And we also know that stimulation of your hypothalamus has been linked to pleasure, which there's been a lot of research uh, being done that we'll talk about later in the chapter concerning drug and alcohol addiction and um, maybe a, a potential connection to the hypothalamus uh, being uh, the part of the brain that, that causes some people to get addicted to drugs uh, and others to not. So it's kind of interesting. An example of the hypothalamus. Uh, first the cat, now we have a rat being shocked. Sorry rat fans, but here we have so a famous experiment done in the 50s uh, of a rat that was put in a little cage and if it could make it across that electrified grid, right, it could press that little stimulation pedal and, and have the electrode connected to its hypothalamus, give it a nice little, little jolt of happiness. And so you would see <laughs> that these rats, in an attempt to make it to the stimulation pedal and get their little high from their hypothalamus, would press it 7,000 times an hour. Um, that's a lot of stimulation. And so you could only press it once and get a high, and then you had to walk back over the electrified grid to uh, kind of recharge the stimulation pedal. And so these rats would drop from exhaustion as a result of painful shocks in an attempt to get their hypothalamus high. So that says a lot about um, addiction even in humans. All right, the hippocampus. Uh, not hippopotamuses in college. It processes conscious uh, episodic memories, which we'll learn about later. So memories of events. So the cerebellum is kind of helping process more unconscious things, but your hippocampus is what hopefully is being engaged right now as you process the information that you need to learn about chapter two. Animals uh, or humans who lose or damage their hippocampus can actually lose the ability to form new memories of facts and events. So when we get to the chapter on memory, I have some, some very wild uh, yet sad stories of individuals who are living their life uh, kind of like an old school video recorder without a tape in it. Like life's happening, but they're not remembering any of it as a result of not having a hippocampus that functions. So stay tuned. That's chapter seven.